I thought I'd take a quick look this week at a particular use of the C-Shop keyword dynamic. Now I did a video quite a while ago on one particular use of dynamic which is the idea of dynamic overloading so you may want to take a look at that. Dynamic more generally you'll often see examples where it's used to connect to things like com objects with com interop where we don't have the metadata available for the compiler to verify that we are making the correct calls. That's why we need a dynamic object. But here we're going to look at a situation where we can use dynamic quite usefully in an entirely .NET and entirely managed environment. So let's take a look at what we're doing here. And firstly, let's look at a really fairly well-known example of this kind of use of dynamic, which is something that we get in MVC applications with the thing called viewback. So if we look at the home controller here on this MVC application, you can see that we're saying viewbag.title equals rock, paper, scissors. So we're setting up the title in there. And then elsewhere, in this case in the layout, we are picking up that viewbag.title and using it for the title of the web page. But the thing about that viewbag is it is a dynamic object. So when we start using it, if I put the dot, we get no IntelliSense support. And in fact, we can put whatever we want in there and the compiler will be perfectly happy. Obviously, that's now not going to work because we've set Wibble in there and we're reading title in there. So that's the problem with dynamic, that it removes compile time errors and turns them into potential runtime errors, which is something we generally want to avoid. Now, in MVC, there's actually an alternative way we can do this because there's also a thing called view data. And view data allows us to access essentially the same data store but with a slightly different syntax. So here we can say put rock, paper, scissors into the entry Wibble. So view data is just a dictionary of key value pairs, but it's actually accessing the same fundamental data store. So we've got exactly the same thing happening both of those to the same data store. And the arguments between them, well, it's obvious here that there is no compiler checking on that key Wibble because it's a string and you don't get any compiler checking on strings. Whereas here, although you might find the syntax a bit nicer, you could get led down the primrose path of believing that Wibble is just a regular property where it's not, it's a dynamic property and therefore we're not getting any checking. So there's pros and cons of each of them. And nowadays the tendency tends to be, I think, a bit more towards using view data, but you will still see that the view bag is used. So that's just an example of it. So what we want to see actually is how can we write our own equivalent of view bag. So if we just switch over here to the console application that I've got, and let's just start out with some basic usage of dynamics. So what I'm going to do is put in a try block and then follow that with a catch. And what I'll do is just display couple of things. I'll display what type of exception we had. So I'm going to say ex.getType.name so we can see what's been thrown. And then also let's just have ex.message so we can see the detailed error message. And then if I just do the most common sort of use of dynamics, I'm going to say dynamic obj equals and then let's just pop hello on there. So it's actually containing a string. And then I could do something like this. I could say console write line. I could say obj dot to upper. We're not getting any IntelliSense support. There's no compile time checking, but we happen to know that string has a to upper. But then if again here, I just try to do something like wibble, then that's going to fail. So if we run that up and drag over the console, we can see the to upper worked fine. But when we tried to call something that isn't a member of string, then we can see the exception is this runtime binder exception, and then it tells the string doesn't have a wibble. So that's a simple example, not much use, because obviously, given that we know this thing is a string, we might as well have declared as a string. But what we want to do is actually have this idea of something similar to that view bag. So I'll add a class that we'll call property bag. And then what I want to do with that, let's do that first. I want to be able to in here say something like dynamic bag equals new property bag. And then to be able to say bag.wibble equals say 27. So we can put an int in there, bag.wobble 
equals hello. So we're basically storing objects. And then we'll read them back out again. So those were setters. Now let's have the getters. So we'll do bag dot wibble, bag dot wobble. And then also let's have one that's not going to work because I haven't set it. So bag dot wobble. So at the moment, none of those will work, but let's start that working. And the way that we can do this, well, fundamentally, the way that this kind of dynamic dispatch works is through an interface, which is iDynamic Meta Object Provider. And if I implement that, you'll see it's just got the one method, get meta object, and that's basically how all of this works. But programming through this interface directly is actually quite tricky. So what we typically do instead is we use a base class that's simply called dynamic object. And if we take a look at that, we'll see that that has this dynamic meta object provider and does a bit of work with that interface to make life easier for us. So that's normally the way you'll do it. You don't need to go to the interface directly. What we're going to need to do here, though, is have our private dictionary, which is going to be a dictionary keyed on string. So those are the entries that we're going to have. And then the values are simply going to be nullable objects. So absolutely anything at all is allowed in there, including null. And we'll call this just values. And we'll just initialize it to a new dictionary. It's not going to change, so let's make it read only as well. And then we're going to start overriding some of those methods we've got in dynamic objects. So if we type override, then we'll see there's quite a lot of these. And the ones we're really interested in are all these various tries. You can see we can deal with methods, we can deal with indexes. What I want to do though is actually deal with a property. So we're going to do the try and let's start with actually the try set member. And you can see that it returns a bool. So that's to say whether we have successfully set the value or not. We get this thing called a binder and then we get the value coming through, which is whatever it's been set to. So what we're going to see here is we can simply say underscore values and then prompting is already binder.name. So this binder contains the information we want and binder.name is going to be wibble or wobble when it comes in. So that's picked up the name that's coming in there. So that's easy enough. And then value, well, it's a nullable object, but again, that's basically what we can see here, either 27 or hello. So very simple to do. It's got to return a bool as to whether it's successful. And actually, it's always going to be successful. So we're not going to reject this in any way whatsoever. So we can always put that in there. So that's the easy part of it. Then we also need to have our getter, because remember, as well as setting these, we're getting them. And so what we'll do here is another override and we'll do the try get member. So similar sort of thing. We get the binder, which is going to give us the name and other information, but that's all we're interested in, just the name. And then now that result is now an out parameter. So we're not using the return type to return the data for this member because we're already using that for the bool that indicates whether this call has been successful or not. So instead, we've got to have an out parameter on that one there. And so what we're now going to do is we're going to see, firstly, if we do have that member. So we're going to say if underscore values dot contains key binder dot name, then we're going to say result equals values binder dot name. So we'll look that up and we'll return true because we've succeeded. Otherwise, we are obliged to set that result. So we'll set that result to null and return false. OK, so if it's got that particular member, then it'll return the value. If not, it'll return false. And that false will be picked up in the base class and throw the exception for the property not being found. And so if we look at that, that's going to work on Wibble and Wobble because we've already given them values, but not on Wobble. So if we run that up, we should see that working perfectly well. And indeed it does. So we're getting 27 for Wibble. We're getting hello for Wobble. And then we're getting the exception when we try for Wobble because it doesn't exist. And exactly the same sort of exception that we had before. So that's a pretty simple example of how we can use dynamic and use the dynamic object base class to put together something fairly simple like a property bag. As we saw when we were looking at those various examples, 
we had ways of accessing properties, which is what we're doing there, but also methods, also indexes, some other things as well. Let's look at a slightly more complex example to see where this could really start being quite helpful. And what I've got here actually in the other application, the MVC that I was showing you a moment ago, this is actually something I put together in an earlier video to show how Signal R works. So again, if you haven't seen that video, if you're interested, do have a look at that. But basically, we've got this rock, paper, scissors game where we can have a couple of players. So let's have a player called Sally waiting for someone else. Let's just open up another window. And in this one, we'll have Harry. And then it pairs them off. And so Harry's playing against Sally. Harry clicks rock, waiting for Sally. Sally clicks paper, and we get a result. So that was all done using Signal R to push those results out to the browser. But what we were doing, if we look at that, is in this hub, we called effectively methods on the browser using this send async. So there, for example, in our send async start game, we are calling a method called start game, and then we're passing three parameters. So player one's name, player two's name, and the name of the entire group. And we can see if we look in the JavaScript down here that there we've got the method start game taking those three parameters. So although there's a lot of plumbing in between the two, effectively we are calling a method from the hub and it's being invoked on the browser over there. And what might be quite nice to do is rather than having to put the name start game in double quotes as a string, wouldn't it be nice to make that look like an actual method that we can call within the hub? And in fact, in early versions of Signal R, I think this happened when the change was made from framework to core, that was precisely what it did. So you could actually call a dynamic method on the hub and it would invoke the method on the JavaScript in the browser. But that's not available now and we'll have to implement that for ourselves if that's what we want to do. So let's get ahead and do that. So what I'm going to do is into our SignalR project, let's add a folder that I'm just going to call helpers. And then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write an extension method. So this group we can see is of type iClientProxy. So we're going to need to extend iClientProxy with something that's going to do our work for us. So let's in here just do an add, new class, just call this extensions, make it a static class, and then we're going to give it a public static. And then this is going to return a dynamic object. So here is where our dynamic is. I'm going to call this client, and then I'm going to make it an extension method for that I client proxy that we were just looking at. And then all that's going to do is return a new class that we haven't written yet that's going to be called signal R dispatcher, which is going to take that proxy as a constructor parameter. So now that we've got that, we should be able to see back over here that on that group, I could now do dot client and just get hold of the namespace. And then because that's dynamic, it's perfectly happy for me to call send async or whatever I want on that. So we'll change that in a moment once we've got this working. So now what we're going to do is actually introduce this signal R dispatcher. So let's add that again to helpers. And that is going to be derived from the dynamic object that we've just been talking about. What I'm then going to do is add in the constructor so we can get a bit of help with that. So if I just do generate constructor and then go back there, we can see it's put in that proxy. Again, that really should be read only. And then what I'm going to do is override another of the methods that we have in dynamic object. In this case, I'm going to go for the try invoke member. So that's the one for when we're calling a method. And so what we can see here is that we've got the binder again, then we've got an array of arguments. So those are the arguments that are being passed in. Could be any size at all, could be empty, whatever. And then we're returning our result once again. So remember what we want to do with that. If we just look back at the original code, we want to call send async on 
something called start game or waiting for player, whatever it may be, and then passing the parameters. So the binder.name is going to be what we have there. So what we might want to do is we'll say var output equals and then underscore proxy dot send async and then binder dot name. And then of course we want to pass in the arguments, which looks pretty easy. But the problem is the way send async works is it's overloaded for different number of arguments. So it's got arg1, arg2, arg3. And of course, we don't know how many are coming through. So we'd have to write quite a complicated bit of code to call those different overloads for the different number of arguments because we've got them in an array. Thankfully, there is another method that makes life a bit easier because there is also this send core async. And if you look at that one, that one does take an array of arguments. So that's much more appropriate. We can just take our args and pass them straight in there. Giving us a little warning there, that's because actually this args, as well as being an array of nullable objects, it itself is nullable. And what we can do there is say args, and then we're going to use a really neat thing called the null coalescing assignment operator. So we say double question mark equals and then we can simply say something like array dot empty object, there needs to be a question mark, so something like that. So what that does is basically it looks at args. If args contain something, so if args is not null, it leaves it alone. But if args is null, then it puts that in there. It's actually the equivalent of saying args equals args double equals null, question mark the empty array, colon args. Okay, and this came in, I think, in something like version 6 or version 7, and it's just a lot neater way to do that for that sort of statement. So basically it means that rather than having to worry about args being null, we'll just have an empty array if args was originally null. Now let's take a look at what's being returned from that send core async. And if we have a look at output, we can see that it is a task. And that's because if we go back to the hub, we were awaiting all of these functions. So you can await a task or anything that's got to get a waiter. We've been doing a lot of videos on that recently. But in this case, we've got this task. And in fact, it's pretty easy to do this. We don't need to make the try invoke member itself asynchronous. We just need to make sure that it returns the task. And remember, that comes through that result. So what we can in fact do is we don't need an output at all. We can just say result equals and then that will make sure that's what gets returned over here and therefore that's what gets awaited. And then the last thing we want to do is simply return our true or false for success. Well, we won't know until we actually hit the JavaScript whether we've sent a valid message here. So we're just going to assume it's working and we'll return true. So that's got that working. And now all we need to do is on here, we can change that. So we're calling the client, which is giving us back our dynamic object. So we can invoke a method called start game and we can start sending those parameters to it. So three parameters in that case. And we can do the same on all of them. So here I can do a client dot waiting for player with no parameters in that case. And then if we just go through the rest of it. So here I can do pending. And in this case, we've got the one parameter. Here I can do drawn with a couple of parameters. And here I can do one with three parameters. So now it's looking like we're actually calling those methods, drawn, one, and pending, and so forth. And as we saw, those are the various methods. So there we've got one, there we've got drawn, there we've got pending. So all of that working fine. And if we run that up, we should see that this is working in exactly the same way. So Sally in there, bring up another window, Harry in there. And then we can start playing and it's all working perfectly well. If we just put a little break in there so we can see what's going on. So let's go to our dispatcher and just have a look in here, say. 
and then let's click rock on that one. So we've come in here, if we look at the binder, we can see that this one is trying to do a pending. If we look at the arguments, we can see we've got the one argument, which is Harry. So it's all working perfectly well, just the same as we had it before. But that said, it is still debatable whether this particular way of using it is really that powerful. This one I'm kind of in two minds about. I like the idea that it looks as though we are calling a method, which effectively we are, even though there's a lot of plumbing in between the two. But it really is the same argument as we saw with the view bag, that if we say view data square brackets title, then that is obvious that there's no compile time checking on the value we put in here. Whereas here, although it's slightly neater syntax, it's not obvious. And the same goes with our calls here, where previously, if we just undo all of that, it's now obvious that these things are freeform because they're in double quotes. Whereas here, you might be fooled into thinking you're actually getting some kind of compile time checking. So I'm not sure that this is a really good example in that this is the way you might want to use it in the real world, but certainly it's a tool you've got in your toolbox and there may be situations where you do want to do this kind of dynamic dispatch. So I hope that was helpful. If you enjoyed it, do click like, do subscribe, and I'll see you next time.